Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Second Civil War in the Caliphate, Early Muslim Expansion by Kings and Generals. Uh, so we've actually only got one more episode in this series, Carthage Raised Again, and then I will be watching Slavery in the Early Caliphate. Uh, though by the time this comes out, maybe they'll have released another episode, uh, so we should enjoy the few that we have left, and I will continue to follow this series as Kings and Generals releases it. So last time, we saw the failed siege of Constantinople, which was a victory for the Byzantines, but don't get me wrong, the Muslims have continued to defeat the Byzantines at basically every other turn. Uh, the Byzantine Empire continues to struggle. Then we saw further civil conflict within the Caliphate, and a big victory for Marwan. Now, this one's called Second Civil War, so presumably we're going to see the continuation of that civil conflict that has been roiling the Caliphate for a couple of years now. Uh, like I said, there was a time of unity when the Caliphate was just expanding, then we seem to have hit a point, and since then it's been almost constant civil conflict and civil war. Uh, so I'm excited to get into this one. If you guys end up enjoying this reaction, I'd appreciate it if you would check out my Patreon, which is linked down below. And without any further ado, let's get into this video. In our previous video, growing anti-Umayyad sentiment and the killing of Caliph Ali's son, Al Hussein, saw Abdullah ibn al zubayr accepted as Caliph across the vast majority of the Caliphate. So heralded was al zubayr's ascension that coins were being minted in his name even on the frontiers of Persia, while the Umayyads under Marwan were restricted to control over Syria alone. But while this new Zubayrid Caliphate's victory may have seemed all but complete, hmm. the colors on a map alone cannot adequately represent the complicated political situation of the divided Caliphate. That's very true, and that's true for almost any polity or region throughout history. And as we can see, you know, even with uh, a more united caliphate behind a single caliph, uh, at this point it's still not enough. There's still too much civil tension. Uh, and we're seeing that Marwan is starting to sort of gain traction. He's starting to rise up. Uh, and I don't know how this is going to end, but, you know, it seems to be going better for him than it was earlier. I'll put it that way. We've also got a shout out for some great coverage of a historical struggle that came to the region a little later, the Crusades. You can get it at Magellan TV. Right All right, there. so this is their ad. Uh, you know, once again, go and check out their video, which is linked in the description. Um, you know, go and check out their month, sponsor. And get a month. You, know, you get a month three, so use their link, like their video, subscribe to their channel, show Kings in general some support for making these fantastic videos. For free by subscribing to Magellan TV via our link in the description. In many cases throughout the empire, local notables had nominally sworn loyalty to Ibn al zubayr while remaining functionally neutral. Yeah, I mean, we talked about this, or I talked about this last time. When you have a state organized like this, um, earlier we seemed to have a more centralized organization of power within the caliphate, but at this point, like most empires of this era through the Middle Ages, I mean, it's not really until the modern era that we see strong centralization of the state. You know, your state's very decentralized. So if you're the caliph or, you know, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire or wherever, you have to rule through those below you, you know, uh, whether they're lords, vassals, or in this case, governors of different provinces. And so these governors... You know, they have their own independent power base centered around a specific region. And so, if you're the Caliph, they're only going to help you out uh, as far as it helps them. And so, when you have all this civil conflict, for a lot of them, it's better to either stay neutral, even if they nominally swear allegiance to the Caliph, or sometimes it's better for them to flip to the other side. So that's why it can be difficult to hold on to power, uh, if you're at the top, with this very decentralized structure. Using the breakdown of authority to avoid Umayyad taxation. Exactly. They're only going to stick with you as long as it helps them. Uh, and what helps them? Well, not having to pay taxes. And so if they can stay neutral or ditch you and not have to pay taxes, then the governors are going to do that. Uh, and you can't necessarily blame them. They have loyalty to themselves, their family, and their region. And that's what they're trying to protect. 
In others, Zubayrid authority was reliant on unsteady alliances with Karajites and Shiites, and though these groups might have made common cause with Ibn al-Zubayr at first in order to topple the Umayyads, an alliance with the Karajites would never be a lasting one unless he adopted their beliefs, alienating his other supporters in the process. Yeah, we've got a lot of political tension going on and a lot of religious tension. Uh, and that is one of the issues when you have religion and politics all mixed up. Uh, we saw this uh, with the Byzantines as well, is that you get these sort of extreme groups who are not satisfied unless you exactly conform to their belief system. Um, when it comes to religion, oftentimes compromise will not work. Um, now, sometimes compromise won't work for politics either. Uh, I mean, you can look at our modern politics today. But compromise is a far more viable option for a purely political issue than for a purely religious issue. And the Shia refused to name him caliph, seeking for a descendant of the murdered Caliph Ali to take wow. his place on the throne. Thus, while Marwan controlled a secure Syrian power base and the Caliphate's treasury, Ibn al-Zubayr struggled to create a united front amongst his supporters. I mean, this is one of the issues we've seen with Caliphs trying to defend themselves from rebels before, which is, you know, the rebels, or whatever you want to call them, those fighting against the established status quo, in this case Marwan, they have a, a smaller base of power, but it's united, it's very unified, versus the Caliph, who may have the entire rest of the Caliphate, but it's very fractured, uh, and he cannot get the sort of support he needs from his subordinates. Leaving the Umayyads stronger and the Zubayrids weaker than their lopsided territorial control would suggest. Yeah. Indeed, shortly after the Umayyad victory in the Battle of Majrahit, Marwan was able to take Egypt, largely unopposed, with... I mean, look, territory is not everything. Uh, if you look at uh, the desert, the area that is now Saudi Arabia, I imagine a lot of that is rather underpopulated because it's desert, whereas a lot of Marwan's territory is probably pretty highly populated. So there's a lot that the map won't necessarily tell us. His clansman, Amma ibn Said, entering Fustat and rallying its population back to the Umayyad cause, while Marwan stood in standoff with Egypt's Zubayrid governor, Abdel Rahman ibn Jadam, outside the city, a major step towards reunifying the Caliphate and a sign of Ibn al-Zubayr's hollow authority. Mm, and now he's taking Egypt, which is traditionally a very resource-rich province. Meanwhile, other outbreaks of civil strife were occurring across the Caliphate, most prominently in the Khorasan region, with Abd Allah ibn Qasim having never been appointed to governor by any caliph, instead forcing out Umayyad governor Salm ibn Ziyad thanks to anti-Umayyad sentiments among the army. Interesting. The power vacuum allowed numerous local communities and factions within the army to drive out officials and seize control across Khorasan. So the Umayyads do have a more stable, unified power base, and they're rebelling against the Caliph, but elsewhere, you know, they're having rebellions against their power. Uh, it's a very complex, tense geopolitical situation. However, Ibn Qasim's effectiveness and brutality in suppressing both rebels and opportunistic Hephthalite raiders reportedly ordering his forces to execute prisoners until the sun set after one victory, Yikes. quickly ended any opposition, allowing him to rule with little regard for either faction during the following years of civil war. Well, that's one way to do things. Uh, I mean, you risk a lot by being that brutal. You risk, of course, further rebellion to your rule, but I guess it can also secure you that rule in the first place, and uh, it does mean that you don't really have to consider the opinions of others because you'll just murder them <laughs> if they oppose you. And in Kufa, a militant Shiite movement known as the Al-Tawabin, or Penitents, was gathering steam. While the death of al Hussein had caused shock and outrage across the entire Muslim community, the impact had been greatest among the Shia community of Kufa, mm. whose support Hussein had been traveling to enlist with many seeking either vengeance or martyrdom to compensate for failing to aid him. With the outbreak of the second fitna, propagandists were sent to garrison towns across Kufa, calling for vengeance and the turnover of power to the family of the Prophet. The movement began to split, however, with the arrival of Mukhtar al fakafi on May 7, 684. Mukhtar claimed to be a follower of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyah, 
a son of Caliph Ali through a different wife than the Prophet's daughter Fatima. Mm. Al Muqtas claims that Ibn al Hanafiya was the promised Mahdi or the guided one, and the prospect of serving an heir to Ali served to sway a portion of the penitents away from their leader, Sulman ibn Sarad, and create a bitter divide. See, and here we see the influence of that religion being involved in politics, or important families or dynastic lines being involved in politics. Uh, it's a way that one can claim legitimacy, uh, a lot more difficult than some other forms of political legitimacy, and it particularly lends itself to, you know, if you're someone who wants to create uh, a political movement or a rebellion from the ground up, well, you can claim some legitimacy by referencing your link to uh, this religious sect or this important family or, you know, whatever. When the Zubayrid governor, Abdallah ibn Yazid, arrived on May 15th, it was all he could do to prevent violence breaking out between the two factions or mm. against their erstwhile Zubayrid allies. Further weakening ibn al Zubayr. His Karajite allies in Mecca deserted him during this same period. Yeah, that's not surprising. <laughs> Considering what we've seen before, that's not surprising. Tiring of Al Zubayr's vague claims of ideological support. I mean, look at this. Al Zubayr's empire is falling apart in front of him. <laughs> you know, he is the caliph. He's supposed to, supposed to control all this territory. Uh, in reality, he does not control very much of it. They relocated to Basra and the Al Yamama region to raise a rebellion of their own under the leadership of Abu Talut. They would remain a major thorn in the side of the Zubayrids, even conquering much of the Arabian Peninsula in the coming years. Wow, interesting. Of all these groups, the first to engage in a major campaign would be Suleiman ibn Surad's penitents who began their long-awaited invasion of Syria on mm. November 15th, 684. Okay. However, despite the lingering grief over Hussein's death and years of propaganda work, Suleiman was greatly disappointed by the turnout when his call to arms finally came, with only 5,000 out of 16,000 whose support had been promised materializing and many of these deserting in the coming months. Mm. Nonetheless, despite Abdallah ibn Yazid's attempts to convince them to remain in Kufa in unity with the Zubayrids, he wasted no time in departing, leaving Kufa on the 17th, first to Hussein's tomb at Kabbalah for a day and night of mourning, and then on to al Qasiya. All right, we're getting some more direct fighting. Uh, we've been seeing a lot of political infighting, tension. Of course, we saw a major battle last time. Perhaps we're going to get another, though Suleiman, you know... He doesn't seem to have that many men. Uh, I would be uh, worried for him going on this offensive. Here they were provided supplies and information by the sympathetic KC chieftain Zafar ibn al-Harith, one of the Zubayrid commanders during the disaster at Maj Rahid. Okay. The Umayyad army, returning from the subjugation of Egypt, had recently left Raqqa and was marching towards the town of Ain al-Wada on their way to invade Iraq. Informed of their whereabouts by Zufar, and enjoying superior mobility with his mounted army, Suleiman made haste to reach the site before his foes. I will say, and this sort of popped into my head, it is fascinating how, you know, the Caliphate hasn't held a lot of this territory for that long at all, and yet regions like Syria and Iraq are now, you know, central to the Caliphate. I mean, they're some of the most important, resource-rich, and population-rich regions of the whole empire, and they were conquered not that long ago from, you know, the Persians and the Romans, and yet they've become so integral to the Caliphate. I just think you know, that that's a pretty interesting change. Arriving five days before the Umayyads and camping to the west of the city in order to cut them off from food and water. Having reinforced in Egypt and numbering close to 20,000, the Umayyad army held an advantage in numbers but was divided yeah. against itself. While Ubidallah ibn... Man, really? So the Umayyads are facing divides too? Seems like no one <laughs> can form uh, a united political faction uh, at this point in the Caliphate's history. Ziyad was in overall command of the army. He was not present during its march through what was thought to be friendly territory, leaving two of his commanders, Al Hussein ibn Numair and Ibn Di al Kala, to squabble over leadership. Uh -oh. traveling and camping separately as they marched unknowingly towards the penitent's ambush. Uh, yeah, that just seems like basic ego. 
you know, these two guys both want to be in charge, both want to be the big man at the top, uh, and, you know, they both can't do that, and so now they're clashing, their authority is clashing. Seems like just a case of some big egos. When they and it's probably going to hurt them. ...arrived at the beginning of January 685, it was Ibn Dial Kala's smaller contingent that first saw battle, with the penitents being led to his camp by a local Bedouin and launching a surprise attack. Though outnumbered, surprise and confusion allowed Suleiman's charging horsemen to put Al Kala's forces to rout, with many being run down and slain and their camp abandoned to be looted. Yikes. This initial engagement would do little to even the odds, however, and Ibn Numeya was sent with a larger force of 12,000 on January 4th. I mean, if the Umayyads can get it together, bring their troops together, then they have a, a pretty intense numerical advantage against their opponents. This should be a pretty easy victory uh, if they can keep it together. During a brief standoff before the battle, the demands of each side were conveyed, with the penitents demanding Ibn Ziyad be turned over to them for his role in Hussein's death, and the Umayyads demanding Suleiman swear fealty to Marwan. Hmm. But these demands were little more than formality, the two armies coming together in battle after their refusal. Yeah, I mean, no one was ever going to accept those demands on either side. Uh, I think it is also worth noting that it seems like, I mean, throughout this process of civil war, which has been going on for a while now, we've seen a lot of hesitancy from Muslims to fight their fellow Muslims. It does seem like as time goes on, that hesitancy starts to fade away. Um, you know, it seems like they had this brief meeting, these negotiations, which were sort of a farce, and now they're going to go straight into it, whereas, you know, if you go back to the first fitna, um, particularly earlier on in that conflict, there was a lot of negotiation, well, we don't want to fight each other, this and that, it does seem like that is going away over time, uh, which isn't surprising, but is definitely significant. The penitents put their mobility to good use, following advice from Zufa, reinforcing or withdrawing contingents as they came under attack, rather than confront the larger Umayyad force head-on. Mm. Both commanders led their respective centers, with elements of Suleiman's horsemen dismounting to support their comrades from the ground where the fighting was thickest. This skirmishing was won by the penitents in the short term, okay. though not without losses and Ibn Numayr's forces withdrew in good order to regroup with those of Ibn Dialkala. Now reunited, with Ibn Ziyad chastising Al-Kala for his earlier defeat and <laughs> stripping him of command to end wow. the feud, the Umayyad army... All right, well, that's one way to end it. You have these two egos clashing. Uh, you know, one way to end it, not necessarily in the most graceful way, but an effective way is just to get one of them out of there, strip one of their command. And, I mean, he had an excuse due to that earlier loss. Now stood poised to bring their full numbers to bear, leading to a day of bloody fighting on the 5th that took a heavy toll on the already outnumbered Shia. Mm. When fighting resumed on the 6th, the exhausted penitents soon found themselves pressed from all sides, unable to prevent the Umayyads from flanking and surrounding their separated cavalry contingents. The same tactics that had previously enabled them to avoid the full weight of Umayyad numbers, now allowing them to be defeated piecemeal. Uh -oh. Suleiman ibn Sarad and several of his close companions were slain by punishing volleys of arrows. Well, that's a pretty important figure, uh, just gone. Um, you know, when you have conflicts like this, um, it's not an uncommon thing for these important leaders, these leaders who are sometimes integral to these movements, uh, I'm not saying Suleiman necessarily was, but he was important to just be murdered, to be killed, and now they're gone. So either someone has to fill that gap or stuff's going to fall apart. With a series of spirited charges by Suleiman's second in command, al Musayyab ibn Najaba, and the late arrival of reinforcements from Basra, doing nothing to turn the tide. Mm. The destruction of the penitent cause brought the Umayyads one step closer to recovering their caliphate. Though Marwan would not long outlive it, dying in the spring oh, wow. of 685, either by plague or assassination carried out by his queen, depending on which accounts you believe. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, do some of you have further information on that? Um, I mean, could have been 
Uh, just a normal death, or could have been an assassination by his queen. Uh, I do not know the context on that at all. Maybe some of you have an explanation on why people think that, or, you know, if she had a motive, why she would have done that. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear, but it seems like we're moving on from Marwan. On to the next. ...was succeeded by his son, Abdel Malik. Ainal Wada did not mark the end of Shia participation in the second Fitna, however. With their leaders dead, survivors from Suleiman's movement turned to Mukhtar al fakafi who had been growing in power in Iraq by appealing to traditionally disadvantaged non-Arab converts. Though he mm. continued to characterize himself as a mere follower of... Yeah, I mean, that is a, that's an interesting way to go. I mean, since the caliphate has expanded, um, you know, into Persian territory and Roman territory, they've picked up a lot of non-Arabs. And a lot of those non-Arabs have converted. There's been a, we've seen a lot of Persian converts in particular, and so you know that is now a new interest group. You know, I imagine there is probably a sizable amount of these individuals. So that is definitely a group you could appeal to. Ibn al Hanafiya, their actual ties remained tenuous, with Mukhtar even using a falsified letter of support from his figurehead to sway local leader Ibrahim ibn al Ashtar to back his coup, according to some <laughs> accounts. Wow. and acting to isolate Ibn al Hanafiya from the movement championing him. But whatever Mukhtar's motivations, October saw him break any remaining ties with Ibn al Zubayr and oust his governor, Abdallah ibn Muti, taking control of most of Iraq and Armenia. Hmm. Further Karajite uprisings toppled Zubayrid authority in southern Persia and Bahrain. We're just seeing Zubayrid territory being completely eaten away. Uh, this map is getting more and more complicated by the month. Leaving both sides of the Persian Gulf in Karajite hands, and Ibn al Zubayr's would be caliphate smaller than ever. Mm. But as weakened as he may have been, he was still far from helpless, defeating both an Umayyad push on Medina under the Qudar tribal leader. Who okay, you know, I kind of thought that the Umayyads were just going to push right in and defeat the Zubayrids, but. It appears they're still kicking, uh, you know, they still have some effort to give it. Though I will say, you know, it's kind of at this point, uh, and we see this a lot, you know, the position of the caliph ruling over the caliphate, or say an emperor ruling over his empire, we've reached the point where, um, you know, the Zubarid still holds the caliphate, they hold the position of caliph, and yet they have lost a sizable chunk of their territory. So at some point, uh, the position... Um, becomes less practically powerful. It may still hold a lot of importance religiously, politi uh, politically, a lot of legitimacy, but sort of the practical power held by the caliph is not going to be as much as it once was. With all of these uh, competitors trying to take over territory that the caliph once held. Ubaysh ibn Dulja and a Karajite attack on Basra to secure his remaining holdings, leaving the final victor of the civil war still in doubt. The next few years would see some of the Umayyad's momentum reversed. The invasion force that had routed Suleiman's penitents made slow progress after this victory, delayed hmm. by Marwan's death and uprisings from the Qaisi tribes that had supported Dahag at March Rahit. Yeah, it seems like Marwan's death has kind of done a number on the Umayyads. Um, you know, before he died, it kind of seemed to me like they were going to sweep in and take over the Caliphate right there and then. But since he's gone, and I'm not saying this can all be attributed to his death, there's certainly other factors at play, they have significantly slowed down. Um, their territorial gain has slowed down. Um, and, you know, like kings in general said, the momentum seems to have shifted. When they finally launched their invasion of Iraq a year and a half later, in the summer of 686, al-Muqtar was at something of a disadvantage, as his attempts to appease both the Arab tribal nobility and non-Arab converts, or Mawali, had fallen through and Ooh. led to attempts by the tribal nobility to depose him over... Uh, well, I said it was a good idea, but I suppose if you have to balance both, that can be a tricky balance to keep. You want to appeal to this new interest group, these non-Arab converts, but I suppose you do risk alienating the traditional Arab elite. And I suppose he, he sort of went too far one direction, and now he's facing some trouble. A perceived erosion of their privileges. This conflict was further stoked by Ibn al-Zubayr's brother and governor of Basra, Musab, 
who courted the disgruntled Kufan nobility in an attempt to regain Iraq. Mm. The death of one of Mukhtar's commanders to plague shortly after his victory over an Umayyad probing force near Mosul sparked rumours that his army had been defeated, with an opportunistic revolt breaking out in late June. Nevertheless, the besieged Mukhtar was able to both put down this coup attempt, holding out in his palace long enough for Ibrahim ibn al-Ashtar's army to return from the Umayyad front and relieve him, and mobilize a large army of predominantly Persian-speaking Mawali and Shia partisans to confront the Umayyads, meeting them at the beginning of August, some 15 miles east of Mosul, on the banks of the Kazia River. Yeah, this is getting really complicated now with these different ethnic groups involved, different communities involved, and different uh, religious sects involved, different types of Muslims. There's now a lot of interests at play, and we're seeing sort of coalitions develop with uh, different groups that come together. Um, so, pretty complex. While Ziyad's army had been estimated to number as Whoa. high as 80,000, this figure is far out of proportion. Yeah, as we've seen many times throughout this series, uh, this is just the basic uh, over-exaggeration. We see this a lot in ancient sources and uh, Muslim sources from this time period. Uh, a, a ton of over-exaggeration. Uh, there's absolutely no chance they had an army that large. With the same army's numbers during the Battle of Ain al-Wada or similar armies raised out of Syria, and is likely reflective of historian Abu Miknaf's anti-Umayyad leanings. Though no fully reliable figure exists, the true number was likely little higher than 30,000. Yeah. Even See, this is what we mean when we say way over-exaggerated. Um, the actual amount of troops was less than half, and it might not even be as high as 30,000. So, you know, it could have been, say, a fourth. Maybe it was around 20,000. That is a fourth of the 80,000 troops initially suggested. In allowing for reinforcement from the remains of the failed push on Medina. Even so, the Umayyads held a definite numerical advantage over the 13,000 under Ibrahim ibn al-Ashtar, but were as weakened by division as before. The commander of their left wing, Umayyad ibn al-Habab, held a meeting with Ibrahim Ooh. the night of August 5th to offer his defection in the coming battle. Following Umayyad's advice, Ibn al-Ashtar wasted no time in bringing the battle to the Umayyads the following morning, ignoring the normal protocol of raiding and skirmishing as his smaller army came crashing into their larger yet still disorganized foe. The initial stages of the battle went in the Umayyads' favor, with the Umayyad right wing under Ibn Numair slaying the commander of Ibn al-Ashtar's right and putting them to flight. However, the fallen banner was quickly taken up by Abdullah ibn Waqa, nephew to one of the Prophet's companions, who rallied mm. enough of the fleeing soldiers back to his side to stall the Umayyad advance. On the Umayyad left, accounts conflict on Umayyad's role, with the historian Al-Kalbi claiming the promised defection never materialized and Umayyad remained loyal to Ibn Ziyad, mm. while others hold he deserted the battlefield. As he and Ibn al-Ashtar converged. Man, that is one of those big historical gaps. That's a big difference. Whether he stayed loyal or defected, that could completely change the tide of the battle. And yet we don't know, because we have conflicting accounts. This is one of the things about history in general, and particularly uh, sort of ancient or uh, you know early medieval history. Uh, we just have really sparse sources, and so say if we have a situation where we don't have any sources, then we really don't know anything, we have to guess. Having one source, better than none, but not great. Having two sources, great. If they conflict, well, that's even worse. <laughs> so we run into a lot of these difficulties when uh, looking at our sources uh, as historians. As peacefully after the battle, the latter is likely closer to the truth. But mm. either way, he took a rather passive role. Okay. His inaction, leaving the Umayyad center open for the Kufan right and center, it seems like those conflicting sources could have been a result of what actually happened, which was Umir sort of remaining neutral, standing back. That could be interpreted as, well, he was still staying loyal, or he was defecting, or perhaps he was finding a middle path. So maybe that's what actually happened. To launch a desperate flanking attack, 
Crucial in this effort was Sharik ibn Jadir al-Taglibi, a warrior who had fought under Caliph Ali in the first fitna, whose furious cavalry charge carved open a path to Ubaid Allah ibn Ziyad and toppled the Umayyad banners. Wow. With the death of Ibn Ziyad and the continuing dissension and rivalry within the Umayyad ranks, the great army quickly dissolved, Umayyad's forces departing peacefully, while many others drowned trying to flee across the Kazir Jeez. River. Yeah, I felt like when Marwan was there, sort of the unity of the Umayyads was one of the advantages they had against their opponents, but as we're seeing here, now their disunity, uh, how fractured they are. Uh, is really contributing to a major loss. Um, you know, take a lesson from that. <laughs> I mean, it's been pretty obvious from this whole thing, but if your faction is not unified, you're going to have a really hard time winning. The short but brutal battle would delay any further Umayyad move against Iraq for several years, but do little to secure Mukhtar's unstable position, with the Zubayrids and his own tribal nobility still conspiring against him. Wow. Getting a real sort of stalemate position here. We've got, you know, several factions now, not even the two, several factions all battling it out. It's seemingly not really getting anywhere. Um, some factions lose territory, but, you know, not really, not to the benefit of the Umayyads, for example. There's, yeah, like I said, there seems to be just this sort of geopolitical stalemate going on between all these different factions in the area as they hold territory, sometimes gain, sometimes lose, but stay in a relatively similar position. Some months later, most likely in the late autumn of 686, Masab ibn al-Zabir would march out of Basra for his own invasion, bolstered by exiled Kufan noble rebels. Given little time to recover, ibn al-Ashtar's army made haste to meet them though without the leader that had carried them to victory against the Umayyads. Mm. Ibn al-Ashtar himself, now the Zubayrid friendly governor of Mosul, abandoned Mukhtar's cause under mm. unclear circumstances in Qazir's aftermath. Well, how about the that? coinciding defection of Umayya, suggesting a likely pact between the two. Well, that's what happens when you have such uh, complicated geopolitical uh, situations, uh, and you have everybody sort of looking out for themselves, you'll get defections of... Pretty important figures like Al Ashtar. Uh, seems like he was definitely a contributing factor to those victories, and now he's gone. So Al Mukhtar may have a harder time. Amma ibn Shamait took command. Though lacking his predecessor's experience, his army soon met with disaster just north of Basra at Matar, with oh. resentment among the tribal nobility in both armies towards the Muali, making up the bulk of Mukhtar's forces, coming to the fore in gruesome fashion. Yikes. While non-Arabs were traditionally barred from serving as mounted warriors, Mukhtar had relaxed this rule and increased their pay to earn their support. Yet at the Battle of Madar, Ibn Shumit once more required them to dismount and fight as foot soldiers. Yeah, see, that, that doesn't seem like a good way to inspire your men. <laughs> you know, this is sort of al-Mukhtar's M.O., is, uh, I mean, he's kind of trying to balance the traditional Arab elites with these new converts, but he's been playing to uh, these new converts, right? Uh, he's been trying to give them some more rights, show them uh, he values them, and so doing something like this, I feel like that's not a great way to motivate them. That doesn't really send them the message that uh, we care about you. That sends them the message that, yeah, so, you know, we want to help you out, but we're gonna have to do things the old way, just for our benefit, briefly. You know, I, I don't know if that's a great strategy. When Ibn Shumayt was slain and his army routed, the Kufan horsemen escaped, while huge numbers of the Muwali infantry were run down and slaughtered yeah. by the vengeful exiles, suffering a massively disproportionate death toll with... Yeah, really brutal. Unsurprising, I mean, this is what happens when you try and take an oppressed group, uh, an underclass group, and, you know, give them some sort of quality or bring them up to the same level as everybody else, uh, the former elites get all panicky uh, and they get vengeful because they feel like something's being taken from them. And then we get gruesome situations like this. Few escaping and no prisoners taken. This disaster shook faith in Mukhtar's messianic movement yeah. and total collapse was not long in coming. That's not at all surprising. Like I said, 
Yeah, that that's you're not really sending the right message there, particularly with the loss. Uh, if you're one of those new converts, I, I think your faith in Al Mukhtar would be seriously shaken. The Zubayrid invasion force made haste by boat and horse towards Kufa, hastily assembling another army and attempting in vain to delay the invaders by flooding the canals along the Euphrates. Mukhtar would personally lead his army in the second desperate clash against the Zubayrids at Harura on Kufa's outskirts. Okay. Mukhtar and his forces fought bravely, with the battle initially in the balance. Muhammad ibn al Ashath, leader of the Kufan exiles fighting under Musab, was slain and the highland mm. Hejazi tribesmen, making up a fifth of the Basran force, fled early in the battle. Wow. Hey, so this is one that Mukhtar could have won. I mean, it started off by going his way. However, these initial successes but... would be brought to naught when the Basran left wing, which, under the cautious al Malab mm. Abi Sufra, had initially held back from the fighting, swung forward crushing and routing Kufan forces already bloodied and exhausted from almost a day's fighting. Though Mukhtar narrowly escaped, his army and hopes were destroyed, and his supporters executed en masse by the victors, Ugh. with the four-month palace siege in Kufa only dragging out the inevitable. On April 3rd, 687, Musab's forces stormed his palace and executed him, swiftly restoring Armenia and Iraq to the Zubayrid fold. Wow. Well, I was waiting until we got the map back up. Would you look at that? I was talking a couple minutes ago about the uh, stalemate situation we found ourselves in. Uh, this geopolitical stalemate between several different factions. But Al Mukhtar is gone. One of those factions has been almost entirely taken out. Not saying that a lot of political tension doesn't remain. I'm sure it does. But Mukhtar is now gone. And the Zubayrids have reclaimed quite a lot of territory. Uh, this is you know, the biggest change in this conflict we've seen in a while. Um, perhaps this can give them some momentum with which they can defeat their other opponents. Though, you know, emphasis on the perhaps. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Other than Karajite raiding and small border confrontations, the resulting Umayyad Sabirid stalemate would persist for the next four years. Ah, uh, more stalemate, of course. <laughs> My hopes were raised. I thought, okay, we're going to get some major change now. Of course not. We're getting years more of stalemate. With both sides exhausted by the long civil war, and no major battles between the two occurred until 691. I mean, at this point, uh, I mean, it's been stalemate for years. Both sides hold some pretty important uh, resource-rich, population-rich territory. Uh, both sides are relatively strong, so I can see how the stalemate would drag on. During this time, the long-neglected frontiers saw action once more, ah. with an Umayyad army under Zubayr ibn Qais dispatched to the mountains of Algeria, where the Byzantine-allied Berber king, Cecilius, had taken advantage of the civil war to overrun much of Ifriqiya. Defeating and killing him in 688, Zubayr retook Cairoan and re-established the Caliphate as the dominant force in the region, mm. with only the Byzantine stronghold of Carthage remaining a threat. And Abd yeah, I mean, if you want to, you know, take over that region, you're going to need Carthage. That is uh, a, an ancient and historically important city of the region. Um, but we continue to see sort of the Muslim um, movement west throughout North Africa. Of course, they were reclaiming territory they had already taken there. But, uh, of course, if you look at the maps of the Caliphate at its largest extent, you know, we see it extending all throughout North Africa uh, into modern-day Spain. And so, you know, we're slowly, gradually moving towards that. Down. Although I, I don't know when the Caliphate will be at its fullest extent. I don't know when that year is, um, but we are moving towards it. Malik remained active against his Zubayrid rivals during the apparent lull as well, engaging in intrigue and diplomacy with Zubayrid supporters across the Caliphate, taking advantage of Ibn al-Zubayr's weakness and the growing apathy towards his predecessor's misdeeds after nearly a decade of war hmm. to chip away at his foe's support base. Okay, Abd al-Malik is uh, he's making some moves, he's taking some land, he's trying to garner support. Uh, let's see how that works for him. Though his next attempt to invade Iraq in 689 
was interrupted by his kinsman, Amr ibn Said's short-lived oh, coup attempt. Of course. The end of the civil war would almost come as an anti-climax after the fierce battles of its first years, with the majority of Masab's army defecting and abandoning him to die when Abd al-Malik finally recaptured Iraq in October wow. 691. Okay, so we, you know, we had the interruption of a coup, another rebellion, classic, classic. Uh, but finally, the Umayyads are retaking, or, well, yeah, retaking uh, a lot of territory, though they haven't been in control for a while at this point. Um, seems like Abdul al-Malik might be moving in the right direction. Abd al-Malik had Masab and his son Isa buried with honor, lamenting the tragedy of the civil war. Yep. But despite his poetic words, he remained ruthless in rooting out any remaining opposition, besieging Mecca, and mopping up Abdullah ibn Zubayr's last supporters the following wow. year. You know, that was a remarkably quick end to a conflict that dragged on for years, and a stalemate between, I mean, the Umayyads and the, the Zubayyads, but uh, several different factions, honestly. Uh, and then the Umayyads ended it just like that. Um, you know, Abdul al-Malik just swept through territory, took it, and there you go. Though putting down the Karajite rebels and independents such as Ibn Qasim would take several more years, the Umayyad Caliphate had emerged victorious against its first would-be usurper. Wow. The second fitna had been a long and bloody affair, marked with a further departure from the unity of the Rashidun era. Look at all the Karajite held land, though. <laughs> yeah, they've really grown their territory quite significantly at this point. Uh, the Umayyads have taken back over. You know, now we're flip-flopping between different dynasties. Uh, how imperial? It's definitely a real empire at this point. Uh, the Umayyads are back in control, but, you know, look at all that territory they still don't hold. That's uh, pretty remarkable. Even during the first fitna, the prospect of Muslims fighting Muslims remained a painful aberration, mm. with concerted efforts at mediation preceding battles, yep. and the conflict being brought into religious arbitration. This is the point I was making earlier, I'll let them make it. But during the second fitna, the sectarian schisms arising out of the first, and the blood feuds that accompanied them, made violence and retribution all too easy to accept. Yeah. Like... Great, I'm glad they made that point. That's exactly what I said earlier in the first fitna. Um, you know, the Muslims wanted to avoid violence against fellow Muslims. Um, now, it still happens. There still was lots of violence, but there were a lot of attempts at negotiation. Versus now, uh, and I think they're exactly right, it's due to the political differences that have now sort of morphed into religious differences, sectarian differences. Now... You know, everyone's far more willing to commit violence against their fellow Muslims. Uh, there's a lot of brutality, massacres going on. Uh, that hesitancy towards violence seems to have completely or almost completely vanished at this point. But shaken though it might have been, the Caliphate remained whole, with further victories still lying ahead in... Now that is pretty remarkable. Honestly, the fact that the Caliphate remained whole, um, it definitely could have fallen apart at any point in the last few years but it has remained um, perhaps because I mean it's completely taken out its Persian competitors and the Byzantines they're also always split divided and vulnerable as well so maybe there was no one to take advantage of it uh, but even so it's still an impressive uh, impressive achievement Africa Asia and even the unsuspecting Visigothic kingdom of Iberia Mm. Our series on early Islamic history will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. All Please right. consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. You guys go and do that. Go and check out their video, like, comment, share. And please do the same on this one, you know? Like, comment, subscribe, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. I uh, really enjoyed this one. Um, like I said, we've got one more sort of main episode in the series, Carthage Raised Again. <laughs> I'm excited for that one. We're uh, getting to Carthage, which, like I mentioned, is a very important city uh, in that region, and historically a very important city. Uh, so that'll be good to get to. And then, uh, I've said it uh, a couple of times, but we will continue to follow the series as they release new episodes. Uh, I'll be sure to keep up to date uh, as fast as I can. So yeah, I had a good time with this one. Uh, I hope you guys did. Uh, I hope you're having a good day today. Uh, and I will see you guys again next time. Goodbye.